Thank you, thank you. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. And um, man, you look good today. In case I haven't met you yet, my name's Nate. And this is a great, thank you, Dad. Give it up for Pastor Wes. No job too small for my illustrations up here. Uh, but turn to your neighbor and say, you look good. Now this might be a dating opportunity. Be careful. Be careful. Oh, so, so funny. But it's, uh, man, it's been such a great series. I hope you've been enjoying it. In case you missed last week on Awaken, Pastor Mark uh, spoke. Man, he preached a great message, didn't he? It was so good. And uh, in case you've missed it, he had um, Seth McDavid wearing some uh, veils. And I think by the fourth one, I wasn't sure if, if Seth was going to be standing. It was awesome. But uh, it was a great message. I really encourage you uh, to check it out. So it's going to be really good. Well, again, we're talking about awaken. And, you know, the definition, in case you've forgotten what it means to be awaken, it means to rouse from sleeping or cause to stop sleeping. Now, obviously, we're going to be relating that to, to spiritual life and, and your heart and your condition of, of your life. But, you know, when, when I think of being awakened, um, I used to believe that I was someone who would sleep just peacefully. In fact, I think my mom even told me I sleep like an angel. (laughs) But over the past 14 years of being married, I have been told, cannot confirm nor deny, that I have a snoring issue and what usually happens is I will be sound asleep, enjoying it, and I will awaken to a, a nudging on my ribs and be told, um, roll over, you're snoring. And I, I look at, I, I was like, oh, and, and you know, it's funny about, I don't, maybe if you had this happen to you, but when you're sleeping and you know that first part where you're just kind of falling asleep and your mind's still going, my L will sometimes say, Nay, you're snoring. And I'll be like, no, I'm not. I'm not even asleep yet. <laughs> and so I think the truth is, you know, um, since I've never heard myself snore, I'm not sure if it actually is happening. So we're just going to go with that. But you know, uh, we, we just believe that on Palm Sunday, which is such a special day, that all, what God is doing in this season is just amazing. That He's awakening hearts. And Palm Sunday is another reminder for us in that we're going to get to our main text that Mark preached out of last week. We're going to continue that series. Um, but I want to start with Palm Sunday because it's so important as you're awakened, you got to know what's really happening in the, in the broader scheme of things, right? So... Palm Sunday, when that, uh, when that took place, you actually have to go back over 500 years before then to a prophecy by Zechariah. And, and here's what it says, Zechariah 9.9. 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. Now, hold on just for a moment. It says rejoice greatly. This is so important because... If you understand the context of what's happening, Israel is actually in captivity. They're in exile right now. They're not at home. It's a dark time to be in the Jewish community and Jewish family. And it's like this amazing contrast of, man, you're, you're in dar- it's dark, there's no hope. And all of a sudden, God speaks through this prophet and he says, rejoice. Now, if, I, if you're like me, When things are not going well, the last thing I want to be is like, rejoice! Have you ever had a friend or somebody that's just way too loud or way too excited? Maybe I'm that person for you this morning. You're welcome. (laughs) But you're you're kind of like, I don't know. But why is the prophet saying that? Because scripture tells us that we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Why do we spend so much time worshiping Jesus and when we gather together, we sing his praises? Because it invites his presence to be awakened in our hearts and lives. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more we transform to be like him. Our hearts begin to shift. So what Zachariah is saying, I want you to know that maybe your story is 
It's not where you want it to be. The dreams you have for your life, it's not good yet. But I've got good news for you. And here's what he says. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you. Righteous and victorious. And this is so interesting. He's righteous and victorious. But what's the next word? Lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Why, why is that so important? The longer you follow Jesus, the more you get to know the heart of God, you realize that oftentimes the way the world thinks that you get success or the way that you gain an influence and power is by being in charge and being in control and being like this powerful person. But actually Jesus flips it upside down. He said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, what do you have to do? You have to look to serve, right? Humble. And that's what he, Jesus does. He flips everything upside down. But if we're being honest, waiting 500 years for a prophecy to take place is a long time. I struggle waiting 500 seconds. If you're trying to do the math, that's about eight minutes. If I had to wait for my popcorn to be done in eight minutes, I'm not going to eat my popcorn. I'm already moved on to something else in the, in the cupboard. And yet, there's something amazing that when we attach our hearts to the promises of God's scripture, that's how we get through the waiting season. Because Proverbs 13, 12 reminds us, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. I want you to think about your life for a second. What are you hoping for? What are you dreaming about? If you were to take a moment and just think about it, how will you feel when that prayer is answered? Could be your health, could be something in your marriage, could be your children, jobs. We all have something that we need God to fill. And here's what the enemy wants you to do. Keep your eyes more on what you want rather than on him. What was the first thing Zachariah said to do while you're waiting? Rejoice! Rejoice! Keep your eyes on Jesus. Your hope is coming. Your king is coming. It will be fulfilled. We serve a God who keeps all of his promises. It's so true and it's so good. And yet for you and for me, we actually have a responsibility that we must take very seriously because in the waiting is actually a testing for you and for me. And here's where the test comes. You ready? Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. So here's the question. Who's supposed to guard your heart? Who's supposed to guard our hearts? I am. But the victim mentality, and you hear this, you say, oh, it's because of that person I'm where I am today. Don't point at your spouse. Don't nudge. It's because of this. It's because of that. If only things would have gone a little bit differently, I would be, I, no, 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 no. That is a victim mindset. Actually, you know who you are? You are a son and a daughter of the king. You are victorious. One of the things we teach our boys, we ask them this question, who are you? And you know what they say? Mighty warriors. So I'm going to practice that with you. You ready? Because I'm looking out here, I'm saying, we have some mighty warriors in the house. So ladies, Zoe women, let's hear you. Who are you? Mighty warriors. Oh, that's pretty good. I want to I hear some men in the house. Are we ready, men? Mighty men, you ready? Who are you? Mighty warriors. Yeah, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. I don't know who won, but it was pretty good. <laughs> but that's who you are. And one of the ways the enemy wants to get you to live like an orphan is to forget who you are by getting you distracted by a dream unmet, a disappointment, a doctor's report, something that 
maybe not be in your control. And it's easy to get into this victim mindset, but actually, actually God has an answer for you and for me. His name's Jesus. There's hope. There's hope. So we must guard our hearts because there's another prophecy that's about 600 years old before it was fulfilled. And it's Ezekiel eleven nineteen, And it says this, and I will give them singleness. Another translation says undivided heart and put a new spirit within them. I will take away their stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart. Isn't that powerful? That points us to what Jesus is doing in our lives and people all around the world. But here's the danger. We see things that look broken or lost and we start saying things and agreeing not with God, but with other stories. And we start saying things like, there's no way that could ever be redeemed. It will always be that way. In fact, things are just getting worse. That's not kingdom. That's not hope. That's not what Jesus came for. He said, I came to seek and to save that what was lost. He's here to help you and I transform everything around us. Do you realize that God put you here in the seven cities for a purpose to transform the people around you? Everywhere you go, everywhere, everywhere you go, you're called to be powerful, to be equipped, to be full of life, to see people, not just walk past them. I look at every single one of you right now as I'm looking you in the eyes, I'm thinking, we have some amazing warriors in the house today. We have champions. Not just the front row, they're champions. But everywhere, you guys are champions. We have to see ourselves differently, don't we? Because, and how do we do that? How, how do we continue to keep that? The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So how do you grow your faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Why are we so committed to scripture at Life Church 7? Because we know every time we read God's word, guess what happens? Faith grows. Faith comes alive. I have so many times I've talked to people on the way out of church like, man, I don't know why I just feel so full of hope and life when I leave the church. I'm like, because you encountered the presence of Jesus. We read scripture, we worshiped. And you know what's so funny? You can do that at home every day. Right? When I was a youth pastor and had just a few more hairs on my head, we, my, my wife and I, we lived in Tacoma and we brought a bunch of seniors over to the tri, oh, excuse me, seven cities, get it right, and uh, brought them over here. And we went out to the Columbia River and we went water skiing. We borrowed my dad's boat. He had a, a beautiful Mastercraft boat. And we're having a great time. And we did, it's really hot, summer day. So what we did is we stopped the boat and we all started swimming. And some of these kids, man, they need to go back to the pool and learn how to swim because they didn't know what they were doing. I was giving kids life jackets like, man, we are not going to lose anybody today. But they weren't very good swimmers. So the river would start drifting pretty fast and the boat would get away from the kids. So I was like, oh man, we better, we better get an anchor, you know. So I turned to one of the, one of the students and I said, um, hey, would you throw that anchor out for us? So the kid literally went like this, grabbed it and just went. <sighs> let go of everything. <laughs> and I looked at the kid and I said, what did you just do? And without even missing a beat, he goes, I did exactly what you told me to do. <laughs> I go, have you ever been on a boat before? And he was like, man, I'm from Tacoma. What are you talking about? I'm like, well, there's boats out there. And he's like, nope, never been on a boat before. And what was so fascinating about it, he had no, now, this is kind of funny. Um, my dad found out that I lost one of his anchors this morning. So that was new news for him. <laughs> But when I asked her to borrow this, but, but here's, the, here's the spiritual truth with all this. A lot of people have access to the anchor, which is Jesus and his word and, and the Holy Spirit, 
but they're not tied to it. So when the wind, the waves, the currents of life, they're pulling you in all kinds of directions, they have no anchor. And you wonder why your moods, your, your thoughts, everything is so like this. It's because you're not tied to the anchor. It doesn't mean it's easy, but what it does mean is I have a source, the word of God that builds my faith so I can look at situations when other people are like, there's no way this can be redeemed. And I say, no, I have a God who can redeem any situation, any person, any life. There's always hope because of who he is. So what do I do? I read the word and I become tied to the anchor. I turn on worship music and I get into his presence and I soak in his glory and I start repeating the truth of what God says, not what I'm reading, not what the news says. And I start contending and all of a sudden hope rises, faith builds and I see the impossible start to take place. And guess what? I am no longer someone who's like this. I am a mighty warrior. And you are too. You are too. So let's go to Matthew 27. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to go there. And this is part of the fulfillment of what Ezekiel was talking about. He says, then behold the veil of the temple. This is what Pastor Mark was reading last week. This week I'm going to read it. And then next week, uh, get ready, my dad's going to read as well. But the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. And the graves were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. In case you're wondering, that last little sentence about five, about the people reading raised to the in the city. Pastor West is going to be talking about that next week. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. Death's coming to life. People are going to be, it's just going to be powerful. I want to encourage you, bring somebody. It's Easter weekend. It's going to be a powerful time to bring somebody. But you know, when I read that passage and you might be asking, so Mark got to talk about a veil. That's pretty cool. And I get to talk about the rock. What's so great about rock splitting? It's powerful. The earth shook. And, the, and everything was completely different. But why are rocks, why is a rock splitting so important? I want to read this to you. If there is no rock hard enough that cannot be split by the power of God then there is no heart hard enough that can't be awakened by the love of God. Some of us need to take a picture of that. Someone already is. I'm going to say that again. If there is no rock hard enough that can't be split by the power of God, then there is no heart hard enough that can't be awakened by the love of God. So here's your big idea this morning. If you're taking notes or just taking pictures and save them. God's love has the power to awaken your heart. God's love has the power to awaken my heart. Because as I'm preaching this message, I got to be honest with you and transparent that there are places in my heart that I still need to be awakened to the love of God. I need his love to challenge me, to change me, to transform me. Every morning, when I, it's just like when you go to bed and you wake up, it's a brand new day. His mercies are new every morning. And I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with his power. I want to walk in boldness. And I want to respond in the way that Jesus would want me to respond. And isn't it so easy to go back into old nature mode? We got to kill that in Jesus' name. We count ourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ. So I just want to encourage you today that there's hope. That there's hope. I was on my way to Krispy Kreme Donuts a couple weeks ago. Can I get a hallelujah? And my, my, my son Taterbug was in the back seat. And we're pulling in and there's somebody there, actually two people, and they were panhandling, asking for money. And, you know, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I have a hard time looking at that 
and not telling a story in my own mind without having any context of why they're there. And so I'm, I'm driving around and as we're pulling into the drive through I, I hear the Holy Spirit. Now it wasn't audible, but it was so clear, um, like, like an impression. It was like, you need to buy those people donuts. And I'll be honest with you, I wanted to say no. I was like, no, that can't be from God. He would never want me to give food to somebody. <laughs> and, and you know how I knew it was the Holy Spirit? My chest, like my heart just started pounding. And I knew that if I didn't obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit, that would, that would be major, major problems. <laughs> Disobedience, right? We don't want to disobey what God's saying. So... I spent the extra three dollars, bought two maple bars. Some of you are getting hungry, I know. And uh, we drove around, and I go up to the person, and I didn't have the child window locks locked. And so Tate's old enough now; he can roll the window down on his own. So I roll my window down, and I go, "Here you go." And I'm just about to say, "God bless you." And, and Tate, Tate yells out, we're out of time for today. God loves you. God loves you. Uh, go, what is, it? what is it? I just forgot it. God made you special and he loves you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Veggie Tales. God made you special and he loves you very much. And it just started to break my heart. I realized that that donut, giving those donuts was actually more for my heart. God did make that person special. And he does love them very much. What if we were to start flipping the script in our own stories and looking at people thinking, God made you special. God made you special. God made you special. And he loves you and loves you and loves you very much. The people around us, your neighbors, the one with the dog that won't stop barking. <laughs> God loves you. He made you special. There is no heart that's too far that the love of God can't conquer. In fact, if we just read that passage just a little farther, look what happens. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly. Truly, this was the Son of God. Do you realize who's saying this? This is the Roman centurion. God is conquering hearts at the moment Jesus, Jesus dies. And here's, here's what's so beautiful about that picture. When Jesus died, you know what he said? It is finished. That is such good news for us today. It's a finished work. It's not something that we're still hoping maybe it'll need to be done more. No, no, no. He finished it at that moment. Why is that so important? It means that you and I have access to the Father through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit at all times and all places, wherever you're at today, right now, this moment and when you leave. So the question is not, will I be able to encounter God's love? Like maybe he will, maybe he won't. No, no. It's all about, all you got to do is this, position your heart to receive. That's all we're asking. That's all God's saying is that if you will get in a place where you can receive from me, I, my goodness is so good. My love is so good. I'm going to pour it out upon you and you will not be able to contain how good I am, how much I love you, how big my plans are for you. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, am I putting myself in a place to receive that kind of love? So as I was, say, as I was doing that, I started thinking, how can I help us do that? So I, I came up with three practical, really simple steps that I believe if you will do these things, I, I hope you'll take notes, that it's like you're going to put yourself in a powerful position to receive the love of God so that your heart can be transformed to send the love of God wherever you go. So here's the first one. If you're taking notes, the number one thing, the first thing we need to do is partner with God to check your heart. Partner with God 
to check your heart. Psalms 139.23 says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. This is really important. It's a, it's a little shift maybe for some of us. One of the dangers a lot of people have is that they search their heart by themselves. It reminds me of people that when you, like someone sneezes and they go on WebMD and diagnose themselves. <laughs> yep. Got that flying swoo, that, 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 what is it? Swine flu again. <laughs> swine flu? What? Yeah, it says right there on WebMD, it's the fourth possible thing. <laughs> Pretty sure that's what I got. I feel like that's a, so often many people, when you go to look at your own heart without God, you're trying to play and pretend to be somebody that you were never designed to be. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the, at the heart. It's fascinating to know that God knows my heart better than me. And he loves me. And I think one of the reasons people don't do that is they're afraid God's just going to say, oh, here's what's wrong, here's what's wrong, here's what's wrong, here's what's wrong. You know why that's wrong? Because that's not how God sees you. He loves you. He's like, oh my goodness, my son, my daughter is asking me to spend time with them and talk about their heart. That's like one of my favorite things in the world to do. Let me just tell you how great you are. I made you. I saw when you were born. What? And the best way to flip that in your own mind, if you have kids and you see them do something, and you're with them and you're cheering them on, your heart comes alive. Think about how much more God's heart comes alive. It's powerful. Partner with him. The second step that I want to invite you to do, now this one, it may sound redundant when I say it at first, but please don't miss this step because this is a step I have missed for much of my, uh, like I would say, adult life. But it's been such a transforming uh, work in my own heart lately that God's really done a deep work. It's been so good for me, just me personally. And this is what it is. Number two, identify the condition of your heart. You're like, identify the condition? What, what, what do I mean by that? It's one thing to say, Holy Spirit, I want you to come and I want you to look at, just come, we'll do all this. But if you don't have the humility to actually say, this is where I'm at, like actually face the truth, because we can deceive ourselves. Oh, I'm doing just fine. But if you don't identify the, the, the place where your heart is actually at this moment, you can never get to where God wants you to get. And here's, here's why I say that. Listen to this. If you grab your phone right now and you wanted to get to, let's say, Pendleton, Oregon, I don't know, or Toronto, Canada, I don't know, any, any destination that's a ways away. When you grab your cell phone and you say, hey, Siri, get me directions to there, the first thing that she says is starting from, and then it will take you to the place, right? If you don't have a starting point, you can't get directions to where you're supposed to be. So we all have to have a starting point, right? We have to have a place where we can begin with God to say, okay, this is where you want me to work at and we're going to go towards it. For me personally, um, it looked like this. My own and I would be going, my wife would be going on a walk and she would ask me this question all the time. Ladies are so good at this question. They say, how are you doing? Men, can you relate to this answer? Good. Fine. And she would always, my wife, she'd probe and she'd say, no, no, really, like, and she'd ask this question and she would say, how are you feeling? Hungry? <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I used to think it was like just a male thing. I think it does tend to be a little bit male. But I actually think it's a cop out. And, it, and the more I, I've actually been through some counseling and he has helped me understand that it's a defense mechanism that I needed to allow the Holy Spirit to places where I have actually pushed him out. And the reason you act out with anger in these situations, the reason you say things or believe these things has nothing to do actually with that situation. It's because you have not allowed the Holy Spirit access to places in your life because you've just said, 
I'm good. So when the Holy Spirit and you partner with him and you actually start saying, identify, okay, this is the root. Not just the symptoms, but this is actually the root of why I'm struggling with these things. You actually have a starting point. Freedom's not too far away. And the trick of the enemy is to get you to say, no, 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 no. That pastor with the shiny forehead. <laughs> it's, yeah, you're good. Remember, we got lunch plans. Remember, we got our next thing we got to get to. Right? In a service like this, the presence of God, everything's happening. And it's like, oh, I want to get to my next thing. Do you really? Or do you want freedom? Is it worth a few more minutes in the presence of God? Because here's the truth. If you will partner with the Holy Spirit, check your heart, identify the condition of your heart, the next thing is the most important thing. Respond in obedience to the Holy Spirit. If I could have the worship team come up. Respond in obedience to the Holy Spirit. So here's what I want to encourage you. You ready? If God speaks to you, let's say it's right here, he speaks to you, and your obedience is over here, the closer those two are together, the more spiritually mature you are. The most mature people are the ones that when they hear God's voice, boom, I obey it. I obey what he's calling me to do. And one of the things that we have to grow in is when God's speaking to us, just follow through with what he says. In 1958, there was a pastor in rural Pennsylvania. They had a beautiful church. Congregation was strong. Three kids. Everything was going smooth and great. And he had this routine where he would watch um, the late night show from at 10 o'clock every night till about midnight. And he just was in this routine every single night. And one night he's watching it and the Holy Spirit began to stir in his heart and said, what if you gave these two hours to prayer? And he was like, uh, but this is funny. (laughs) And he said that it became so strong, he actually went and sold his television. Soon after he did this, he looks at a magazine called The Time Magazine, and there's a picture in there of seven young boys who had just murdered somebody and they're on trial in New York and his heart just completely was undone by this and something that he would have never seen before his heart was awakened to the brokenness in these boys and he knew he had to go to these boys so he gets in his car he drives to New York and he shows up to the courtroom where these boys are on trial. And he walks in, interrupts the judge and says, I need to tell them about Jesus. And they throw him out of the court. So this begins a series of events where he starts making trips back and forth and he ends up running and and doing an event at a boxing arena. And he invites every single gang that's all around, that's part of these guys there. And he preaches the gospel from a boxing ring. They thought they were coming to fight and they're getting saved. And one of the man's name who got saved, his name was Nick, and he was one of the most vicious people in all of these gangs, and he had a knife, and he had killed people before. And he looked at this pastor and he said, I am gonna cut you up into a million little pieces. And he looked at him without missing a beat, and he said, every single one of those million little pieces will still love you. At that moment, that man just wept, that boy just wept and broke into tears. His name was Nicky Cruz. And if you know the story, the pastor's name was David Wilkerson, who started Teen Challenge, still the number one uh, program for addiction as far as setting people free, their rate of getting people free in the nation. He also started Times Square Church. And you know what's amazing? All of those things happen because somebody listened to the Holy Spirit and said yes. And as I look around this room, I see a bunch of people who are world changers, 
who are transforming their families. The cities of Richland, Pasco, Burbank, wherever you live, Othello. We have people coming from Toppenish. It's amazing. Kennewick. West Richland. <laughs> wherever you're from, God has you there for a reason. Would you stand with me for a moment? Because the final piece is the next step that I'm praying that every single one of us will take. Allow God to awaken your heart today. So what I want you to do is take your hands over your heart just for a moment. And I want you to kind of go through those steps that I outlined for a moment. Partner with the Holy Spirit. Partner with Him. Find your starting point. And then all you have to do is obey. I'm praying and I'm believing today that there are going to be people, whether you're online or you're in this room, I know that there are hearts awakening today. Some for the first time, there's going to be salvations today. I'm praying for household salvations in Jesus' name. There's no heart that's too hard that God's love cannot conquer. Your next step and my next step this morning is allowing God to awaken our hearts today. So Father, right now, I just lift up every person with their hands over their hearts. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you would touch them. In just a moment, we have the salvation opportunity. I just pray that there would be people that would respond to you. I just keep hearing God saying there's addictions that are gonna be broken off of people today. I partner with that right now in Jesus' name. The only person we're going to worship is you, Jesus. We love you. As I'm praying for you right now with your hands over your heart, you can look at me. I just feel compelled by the Holy Spirit. There's some of us that need to take a step of faith. And that looks like getting out of your seat. And as we worship for these next few moments, just come down to the altar. Maybe you can get on your knees. Whatever you want to do in the first service, there were so many people on their knees. It was powerful. But this is a time for you to partner with the Holy Spirit. If God's speaking to you, just take a step of faith and watch what he will do.